Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this book talk on mobile media and social intimacies in Asia, brought to you by the De La Salle University Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub in partnership with the Department of Communication. I'm Dr. Fernando A. Santiago Jr. and I will be your host this afternoon. Now the views expressed in the webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub. And also this webinar is being recorded. Now later, uh, we shall have an open forum. Please feel free to use your raise hand button. Uh, you may type your questions in the Q&A box. You may also use the chat box. So let's, um, let's proceed with the um, uh, welcome remarks to be delivered by the chair of the Department of Communication of De La Salle University, Dr. Maria Angeli Diaz. Good morning. I'm Angeli Diaz, Chair of the Department of Communication at De La Salle University, Manila. On behalf of my colleagues, I'd like to welcome you to today's book talk on mobile media and social intimacies in Asia. Published in 2020 by Springer, this volume is co-edited by our very own Jason Cabanas and Lia Ultioko of California State University, San Marcos. The book has received very positive academic reviews that point to its contribution to fresh empirical research and to theorizing about intimacy. The panel for today's book talk features scholars based in universities from the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and Hong Kong. This reflects our department's efforts at global scholarly engagement, which includes international research collaborations, special international guest lectures, and hosting international visiting scholars. So I hope you enjoyed today's discussion. Once again, a very warm welcome from Manila. Thank you. Now, please allow me to provide an overview of the book. Mobile Media and Social Intimacies in Asia, Reconfiguring Local Ties and Enacting Global Relationships is a volume co-edited by Jason Vincent A. Cabanez of De La Salle University and Cecilia S. Uitioko of the California State University, San Marcos. Published by Springer, this book brings together cutting edge studies from emerging scholars of East and Southeast Asia who explore the role of mobile media in the contemporary transformation of the region's social intimacies, from the romantic to the familial to the communal. By providing a regional and transnational overview of such studies, it affords new insights into how these mobile technologies have contributed to the rise of global intimacies. This pertains to the normalization and intensification of how people's relationships of closeness are entangled in the ever-shifting and constantly negotiated flows between global modernity and the local everyday life. In providing case studies of mobile media and local intimacies, the chapters in the volume attend to a broad range of countries that include China, Korea, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Vietnam, and Taiwan. Now, I will introduce the speakers uh, this afternoon. Um, well, the first will be the co-editors of the volume. Jason Vincent Incabanas is Associate Professor in Communication at De La Salle University and a research affiliated of, affiliate of the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub. He has a PhD from the University of Leeds, UK. He is incoming chair of the Ethnicity and Race in Communication Division of the International Communication Association and is also associate editor of Communication Culture and Critique. His primary research focus is on cross-cultural intimacies and solidarities. He is currently principal investigator for the project Imaginaries of Intimacy in Cultural Diplomacy, Korean Television Series, Filipino Understandings of Romance, and Cross-Cultural Encounters of Social Values, funded by the Korea Foundation 
via the University of the Philippines Korea Research Center. Now his co-editor, Cecilia S. Cecilia S. Uitioko, Tioko, is Associate Professor of Media Studies in the Department of Communication at California State University, San Marcos, USA. She holds a PhD in Cultural Studies from George Mason University, and her research is primarily engaged in interrogating the relationships between media, culture, and globalization. In particular, she studies digital inequality and the telecommunication industry in the Philippines and digital mobile media and transnational Filipino migrants. Her work has been published in Continuum, Journal of Media and Cultural Studies, Communication Research and Practice, Media International Australia, and various edited works. Now, for the book chapter contributors, we have James Cummings, who is an ESRC postdoctoral research fellow at Newcastle University, UK. His research explores the lives of gay men in the People's Republic of China, and he takes a phenomenological and ethnographic approach to understanding the everyday social material and technological dynamics by which gay lives in the PRC are produced and regulated. And then we have Hattie Liu, who received her PhD from the School of Journalism and Communication at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Hong Kong SAR, where she completed her dissertation on anti-fandom in micro-celebrity culture. Her research interests include fan cultures, internet cultures, television studies, and popular music. Specifically, she enjoys discovering the meanings people make in their interactions with media content, as well as the platforms and devices that deliver them. And last but not least is Ha Huang, who is a PhD candidate at the Institute for, Cultural, for Culture and Society, uh, Western Sydney University, Australia. Her current research examines the Korean wave in Vietnam as a symptom of cultural globalization in light of recent developments of social media. The research analysis analyzes rather several distinctive ways in which Korean popular culture and television, uh, co Korean popular music and television dramas affect emotional and intimate sphere of the fans through a few case studies. Before commencing her postgraduate study, Ha taught undergraduate courses in media and communication at the School of Journalism and Communication, University of Social Sciences and Humanities of the Vietnam National University in Hanoi. So uh, those are our speakers this afternoon, and I have the pleasure to introduce, uh, well, Dr. Jason Vincent Cabanes and Dr. Leah Uitioko okay, to talk about mobile media and the rise of global intimacies in Asia. Okay, you have the floor, Jace. Thank you so much, Ferdy, and uh, thanks as well to our department chair, Dr. Angeli Diaz, for uh, that welcome. Uh, so, Leah and I will be talking about, uh, we will draw from our uh, chapter in the book, the introductory chapter, entitled Mobile Media and uh, the Rise of uh, Local Intimacies. So, uh, just to formally start this, good afternoon, uh, Manila, Hong Kong, and Haiphong. Uh, and good morning, very early morning in Newcastle. Uh, and good evening, San Diego, and good day wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us for this uh, book event. Uh, we'd like to uh, thank, of course, the LSU Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub and the Communication Department for uh, hosting us today. Uh, despite these very challenging times, we're very excited to be here and finally be talking about our edited volume mobile media and social intimacies in Asia, recon reconfiguring ties and enacting uh, global relationships. Okay. And then let me just begin by uh, sharing our slide. Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, <laughs> we'll get our slides sorted out. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Right. So, hi everyone. So, um, 
the idea of uh, our book uh, emerged from what Jason and I were seeing as a lack of sustained programmatic research on what the ubiquity of mobile media might mean for the contemporary transformation of social intimacies in Asia. And we thought that this was an urgent project because of two things. So first um, is that the contemporary transformations in romantic family and community relationships in Asia has already been underway for some time. Some examples of this include women shifting um, the imaginaries and practices of intimate relationships of love, romance, and sex, um, parents and children coping with the normalization of transnational families, cultural minorities, and building communities of support and activism. Another thing is that, and this speaks to our particular interest in media, communication, and cultural studies, is the increasing cen increasingly central role of mobile media in a region characterized by technological ubiquity and advances, but also unevenness. So here we see in Asia, we, um, a mix of um, digitally and technologically innovative future trajectories, as well as continuing asymmetrical access. Uh Earlier, Fernie gave us a bit of an uh, introduction to the book, but I want to uh, delve a little deeper uh, into it. Um, and I want to say that our book really illustrates uh, the differing ways in which mobile media might be embedded in the region's divergent articulations of social intimacies, which really reflect the ongoing tensions between Western and Asian um, imaginaries of, uh, of intimacy. Um, well, for one, the, the book shows how social intimacies, uh, the, 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 because we use the word social intimacies, uh, what we really deliberately signal here is that even the most private forms of uh, uh, social relationships are, of course, always imbricated in, in broader societal uh, dynamics. And in this way, our book connects with other works that aim to reemphasize the social nature of intimacy as well as works on media and intimacy that attend to the social element of communication. And our focus on Asia is because we think that uh, it's an especially productive region to think through the social dimension of intimacies because of how very pronounced it, it is. Um, and crucially because of the enactment of many of these intimacies uh, now often involving the use of um, mobile media. And so in our book, uh, which, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to plug a little bit. There's a QR code that you can see on the screen there. If you scan that QR code, uh, you should be able to get to the Springer site where if you wanted to, you could uh, purchase or download uh, the whole book or particular uh, chapters in, in the book. And so across this book, uh, we have uh, uh, cases that span a broad range of countries that uh, include uh, China, Korea, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, uh, Vietnam, and, and Taiwan. Uh, and in, in this edited volume, we sought to map out the different levels of impact that mobile media might have on social intimacies, uh, not only across these different country contexts, but across different technological contexts as well, from deprivation to good enough access uh, to uh, information societies. Although in the end, what you'll find is that uh, the population studied in the chapters in our book naturally gravitated toward uh, polymedia-enabled users, uh, although with still very differing uh, degrees. Um, and I think it's also worth noting that uh, the different case studies, as you will see in our uh, panel today, cover social media platforms that are very different. Uh, so from, from things like Facebook and Instagram to messaging apps like KakaoTalk and WhatsApp, uh, and to dating apps like uh, Tinder and uh, Blue as well. So in our book, we develop this uh, a concept called global intimacies, right? And this uh, uh, global intimacies captures the role that mobile technologies play in the experience of intimate relationships in Asia. It focuses on how mobile media use is enabled in broader imaginaries and practices of social intimacies in everyday life. Global intimacies emphasizes that technologies have been central to people's attempts at navigating social intimacies that are entwined in both the global and the local. 
It also refers to how mobile technologies have both normalized and intensified the entanglement of people's relationships of closeness with the ever shifting and constantly negotiated flows between global modernity and local everyday life. On one hand, global intimacies builds on, Robert, on Roland Robertson's notion of globalization, in that it emphasizes, quote, the simultaneity and interpenetration of what are conventionally called the global and the local, or in more general vein, the universal and the particular, end quote. It highlights how this dynamic of simultaneity and interpenetration manifests in mobile mediated relationships. On the other hand, this concept also seeks to nuance Robertson's thesis in the context of East and Southeast Asia. It, it posits that what we define as local emerges from the region's negotiations with global forces, including its colonial pasts and neo, and neo slash post-colonial present. In the context of the current global pandemic, uh, local intimacies has become even more pronounced. We've actually, Lee and I have begun exploring how COVID-19 has made commonplace the experience of enduring prolonged physical separation from our intimate partners, relatives, friends, community groups, and, and other close, close relations. Uh, together with this, the pandemic has also intensified our experience of mitigating the challenges of being far away from our loved ones by using mobile media both to sustain old ties and to forge new ones as well. So Leah is actually currently examining how the everyday lives of elite transnational migrants have been reconfigured during the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of quarantines, lockdowns, and border restrictions, uh, elite migrants have become more dependent on digital media to keep in touch with family, friends, and the homeland, discovering new ways to connect through new apps and new online social activities. So such digital connections have also led to the establishment of new routines and traditions, as well as the resurfacing of uh, social obligations in um, the Philippines. Now, on, on my end, I've begun looking at how cosmopolitan Filipinos living in Manila are uh, exploring quarant zone romances where socially isolated individuals find virtual companionships in relations that remain within the dating app and only for the duration of the enhanced lockdown here in the city. Um, I'm looking at the complications of how such intimacies are premised on a cosmopolitan lifestyle common in the West and on a rich polymedia access available to, well, primarily to the middle classes here. So we hope that there will be more engagement with the notion of local intimacies in upcoming research. Uh, but in this book talk panel, the spotlight is on the works from the edited volume that inspired this idea of local intimacies. So our book um, um, heuristically divides the contributions between reconfiguring the local and enacting uh, global relationships. So chapters two and three focus on the possibilities and challenges that individuals are confronted with when there is a strong tension between the transformations in social intimacies offered by mobile media and the persistence of ideal social intimacies grounded in local Asian contexts. Chapters four, five, and six present cases that are illustrative of what happens when the persistence of particular kinds of ideal social intimacies um, reign in the reconfigurations afforded by mobile media or vice versa when mobile media affordances strongly reconfigure local social intimacies. So if the first part of our book talks about reconfiguring local ties, the second part is about enacting uh, global relationships. So all chapters, including chapter seven, uh, show that while mobile media enable global and transnational connections, the specificities of local environments continue to shape these me mediated intimate relationships. Uh, chapters eight and nine uh, show that there's a, a special emphasis on how social intimacies uh, that mobile media allow actually become subject to a transnational form of surveillance brought about by the ubiquity of, of these same technologies. Meanwhile, uh, chapters 10 and 11 carry on with a concern with transnational families. And chapter 12 looks at the enactment of global social intimacies in a community context. But of course, in all of these cases, mobile mediated global intimacies are always an interplay 
of both the dynamics of reconfiguring local ties and enacting global relationships. And this should become clear once, once, um, once we listen to the rest of the exciting research presentations in our panel today. So we, we are very grateful to um, Sun San Lim, um, the editor of the Springer series, Mobile Communication in Asia, Local Insights, Global Implications, um, where our, you know, which our book is part of. Um, she was so generous with both her scholarly advice and her moral support throughout the time that we were putting this volume together. Jason and I are, of course, very proud to have worked with James, Hattie, and Ha, who are presenting with us today. And we are equally proud to have collaborated with our other co-authors and contributors, Hong Chen, Christian Coliantes, Urban Cabalquinto, Julian Hopkins, um, Yong Ah Jung, Ting Yu Kang, Wen Jing Liu, and Jung Yun Moon. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, we look forward to engaging with you later in the, the Q&A. So we're turning it over to our other uh, co-panelists in today's book talk. Thanks, Jason, Leah. Now, before we proceed uh, to the book chapter contributors, uh, just a reminder to our participants, you may type in your questions at any point in time in the chat box or the Q&A box, or you can reserve your questions for later. You can use your raise hand button and you can answer your question, your question live. All right, so our next speaker is Dr. James Cummings. James, please. Okay, thank you very much. I could just uh, start my PowerPoint. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. So my chapter focuses on gay men in the People's Republic of China and their use of internet and mobile technologies in their intimate relationships. Um, and I take intimate relationships to include a broad range of sexual, social, and romantic relationships that we might include under the category of intimacy. Now the themes of identity and intimacy are intertwined in the chapter as they explore how internet and mobile technologies are implicated in the related processes by which gay men negotiate particular understandings of themselves and take up these self-understandings in the pursuits and practice of intimate relationships. Overall, I argue that for gay men in the PRC, sexual identity or what it means to be gay amongst other terms of self-description is caught up with cultures of intimacy or the various forms and practices of relationships that are seen as possible and desirable. And both of these are negotiated and regulated through and in relation to internet and mobile technologies. The chapter is based on ethnographic research and 30 in-depth interviews with gay men in the PRC's Hainan province. The interviews had a biographical quality and they were part of a wider project that explored a range of everyday social and material uh, contexts that shape gay men's understandings of themselves. So state censorship in the PRC largely limits mainstream representations of uh, sexuality to cisgender heterosexuality. While deeply entrenched heteronormativity within family, workplace, and educational settings upholds the taboo status of non-heterosexual intimacies and limits the spaces available for their formation and practice. So within this context, internet and mobile technologies operate as privileged sites for the representation of sexual diversity and the formation of non-heterosexual intimacies. For gay men, their first encounters with sexual discourses beyond those of heterosexuality, marriage, and reproduction often take place through digital channels. Amongst my participants, many men did speak of early experiences of sex and intimate contact with other men uh, that were not prearranged through digital platforms. However, for the majority, it was only after searching online for information about same-sex desires that they came to place themselves within particular sexual categories as gay or homosexual or tongzhi, 
and began to actively seek out other such categorized men. Internet and mobile technologies were therefore seen as vital in both participants' biographical narratives and their everyday lives. Participants spoke passionately about three key functions of internet and mobile technologies. Firstly, the use of internet technologies to access diverse sexual discourses and to find other men. Secondly, the ways in which their perceptions of themselves, others and the world around them were shaped by new mobile and geolocative technologies. And finally, their concerns over the relationship between internet and mobile technologies and what they perceived as, a hyper, as the hypersexualization and desocialization of gay identities and intimacies. And these three fields of concern are the focus of my chapter's analytical sections. The first section explores participants' accounts of their early experiences of using internet technologies to access diverse sexual discourses and to connect with other men seeking men. For participants over the age of 30, such narratives often centered on the arrival and popularization of the internet in the PRC in the late 1990s. This was often figured as a sexual watershed uh, and a period, uh, a sexual watershed prior to which intimacies between men had been sporadic and circumstantial. The ability to find other men online was seen to enable purposeful and active intimate connections. It was also understood that in online settings, uh, in online settings, other men could be recognized as gay simply by virtue of their presence on particular websites or chat platforms. The internet was therefore seen to have, signal, uh, to have uh, installed seemingly objective notions of sexual identity or categorization as the framework through which intimate connections were sought and established. Younger participants who had grown up with the internet uh, spoke of early online searches for the meanings of their desires for men. It was through such searching and the information that they accessed that they learned that there were other men who desired men. They made contact with these others and they came to categorize both themselves and others as gay. In disparate ways then, narratives of early use of internet technologies to find and connect with other gay men given by both older and younger participants spoke powerfully of the extent to which internet technologies were seen to have been vital in processes in the negotiation of sexual identities, the formation of intimate social and sexual connections, and the emergence of feelings of belonging and community. Now, the emergence of mobile internet and the popularization of apps that use global positioning technology, allowing users to engage with one another on the basis of their physical proximity, has profoundly shaped the spatial and bodily relations of intimacy for gay men in the PRC. The second analytical section of the chapter focuses on discussions of the mobile app Blued, which is the PRC's most popular geolocative dating app for men seeking men. As the quote in the chapter's title highlights, with Blued, now you can see who's around you. Blued uses a grid interface to present users to one another in the form of profile images arranged in accordance with their offline proximity. And as such, identities and intimacies are spatialized and become visible in particular ways. In terms of spatiality, the shift from computer-based to mobile located technologies has mobilized the capacity to find other men. Using Blued, gay men are not only accessible within abstract online space, but are shown to be present within one's immediate offline vicinity. This opens up the possibility of non-heterosexual connection and intimacy as part of everyday movements through urban and rural spaces. In terms of visibility, Blued foregrounds the profile picture as the primary interface through which gay men encounter one another. For men who include images of themselves on their Blued profiles, contexts of online and offline identification can collapse. It becomes possible for users to recognize one another in on uh, what recognize one another in offline physical space and identification as gay becomes something that can be mobile embodied and visible to others. While the possibility of seeing and being seen by other gay men within everyday movements through offline spaces opens up new and sometimes exciting possibilities for the performance and practice of identity and intimacy. 
there are also concomitant risks of becoming visible as gay within spaces where men may prefer to maintain the pretense of heterosexuality. For example, in family, workplace, or educational settings, as spaces within which deviations from heterosexuality may lead to marginalization, exclusion, and violence. The final section explores debates amongst gay men over the extent to which internet and mobile technologies should be used in the pursuit of sexual, social, or romantic relationships with other men. While most men acknowledge their use of such technologies to establish a range of intimate relationships, many also lamented what they saw as a hypersexualized emergent gay culture. And they were concerned that internet and mobile technologies accelerate and desocialize interactions between gay men, orienting interactions towards casual hookups at the expense of friendships and long-term relationships. I suggest that these moralizing debates speak of the fraught status of, of gay identities in the PRC. They signal concerns over the extent to which being gay is figured as a predominantly sexual, social, or romantic identity. And they highlight attempts to legitimize gay identities and intimacies by framing them in terms of sexual and moral conservatism. Internet and mobile technologies are key sites within and in relation to which this configuration and regulation of gay identities and intimacies is taking place in the PRC. So the role of digital media as vectors for the dissemination of diverse sexual discourses <clears throat> in the PRC has been widely noted in previous research. However, much less attention has been paid to the everyday ways in which non-heterosexual people are actually using internet and mobile technologies. My chapter contributes to understanding relationships between internet and mobile technologies and non-heterosexual intimacies and identities in the PRC by providing insight into the role that these technologies play in the interactional and everyday processes through which gay men find one another and how these digitally enabled connections shape understandings of selves, others, and the possibilities for intimate relationships. These insights are also situated within the socio-cultural and political context of the PRC, as one in which non-heterosexual identities and intimacies remain largely absent from mainstream media, in which fears of being outed limit spaces for the embodiment and performance of identity and intimacy and one in which the meanings of non-heterosexual identities and notions of appropriate and inappropriate intimacies are still emergent and highly contested. Thank you. Okay, thank you, James. And that was Dr. James Cummings of Newcastle University, UK. Our next speaker is Hattie Liu of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Hong Kong, so Hattie. Hi everyone, uh, thanks to the moderators. Uh, let me just share my slides. Sorry, give me a second. Uh, yes, so I'll share with you guys uh, what I wrote in this uh, book. So it's a, basically a fandom study, and it's uh, um, about uh, how fans in fan groups in WhatsApp, uh, you know, use their chat to uh, to derive certain meanings in their fandom. So uh, WhatsApp is basically like a, like a chat app. So if you're not familiar with that, it's similar to like iMessage, Line, Kakao, or WeChat. Okay, so functionally, they are very... Um, Conceptual, concept, uh, conceptually similar. Okay, so uh, just a very quick background on why I wanted to do this study. So uh, basically we know that uh, fans adopt technology uh, very quickly into their fan practices. And we do know that um, from existing studies, um, digital media is actually very, uh, has shaped fandom a lot. So for example, in terms of communication, creative production and so on. So um, we do know that so sociality of fandom is one of major concerns, uh, especially with social networks uh, coming into play in you know the last decade or so. And but however, uh, most of it is done like on Twitter, you know, Facebook and stuff like that. Um, 
right? There are very few works about, you know, small social networks, small and close private social networks, such as those on mobile platforms, such as like uh, WhatsApp, which I'm, uh, which is the subject of my research, and also, you know, uh, other social media such as uh, Snapchat and so on. Okay, so, uh, sorry, what's happening? Uh, sorry. Okay, so when we talk about fan studies, uh, the idea of fan community is very important. Um, and when we talk about fan communities on certain uh, very specific platforms, uh, the consensus is that you know technical and cultural understanding is very important. So if you can see the two examples there, uh, there are two GIFs that I got from Tumblr and they're from um, the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe fandom. So if you do not have, for example, the technical understanding of how to do it, uh, how to upload it, where, how to make a GIF and so on, and the cultural understanding of, you know, the fandom actually ships these two characters. Uh, these GIFs actually have no meaning for you. Okay, so uh, basically that's uh, the idea of the technical and cultural understanding being very important uh, when we talk about certain uh, platforms, fandom on very specific platforms. So uh, when we talk about social media, uh, there's some uh, uh, argument that, you know, yeah, you know, we, we, we see that, oh, social media brings people together and so on. But there's also the idea that um, it doesn't, yeah, it brings people together, but it doesn't really build community in the sense that uh, how we knew it before. So, for example, if you look at the two um, bu speech bubbles there, uh, the main idea is that, you know, there has to be some kind of um, interaction, discussion, you know, meaningful discussion, uh, some kind of investment. Uh, but with uh, contemporary social media where, you know, networks are very personalized rather than, you know, uh, focusing on group collectivity where interaction is like a like or a share, uh, people are wondering, you know, um, you know, okay, so there's like a lot more people that you can so-called connect with, but is this actually a community? So that is one of the questions uh, that you know uh, people are having in their mind. So uh, giving this context, you know, uh, we can actually think of WhatsApp groups as um, something that as uh, fans try to participate in to actually get around that whole like, okay, what is this still a community? So we we talk about it in like three uh, three terms. So yes, uh, fans adopt new technology. So this is kind of like a continuation of uh, what has always been done in fandom. And secondly, uh, yes, social media is very uh, readily adopted by fans because being a fan itself is very, uh, it's a very social experience. Even if you do not go out there to look for other fans, um, at the very least, you imagine yourself as being part of you know, a larger fandom. And um, thirdly, um, closed social networks such as that as uh, in WhatsApp actually provide can provide the opportunity for uh, in-depth uh, su and sustained en en engagement that a lot of social media actually uh, does not allow. Okay, so uh, in this study, I actually kind of conceptualize it uh, using a few key terms. So the first one would be uh, mobile intimacy. So the idea of this is that intimacy is mobile across many things, for example, geography and time, which is the most obvious, but also across different technologies, across different psychological states and so on. Um, so um, basically, uh, it is even more enhanced. The idea is not new, but the, the, the whole thing is even more enhanced with uh, mobile phones, mobile media, because it is basically with you everywhere and you do everything on it. Okay, so uh, in terms of that, um, mobile media actually helps to enhance mobile intimacy uh, through uh, you know, overlapping the physical space with an electronic space that's firstly always with you, uh, but it's also emotional and social and relational. And to put it into fandom, um, basically uh, what it provides, uh, mo what mobile devices provide and the apps that come with the mobile devices provide is a kind of um, mobile intimacy that is uh, an augmentation of previous experiences in fandom. Okay, so the second uh, concept that is useful in this uh, study is the idea that sociability has, has shifted. Okay, so uh, what it means is that you know, place and time is not so important anymore. So, uh, you know, traveling to a place is not as valuable anymore. The idea of proximity is actually more important and the idea of effect is more important. So uh, we do understand that, you know, in this sense, uh, WhatsApp fan groups are actually effective spaces. And uh, continuing this, we bring in the concept of scalable social sociability. Uh, basically, the idea is that, you know, 
um, it's difficult to use the frame of traditional media to, to, to talk about you know, digital, you know, social media and so on. Because of the internet, everything is like you know, public media and private media, for example, is already quite you know, indistinguish indistinguishable. So the idea is that uh, when we talk about scalable sociability, uh, we, we talk about it, we understand media in two dimensions, the group size, you know, who's, who are you engaging with, how big is the audience and so on, and the degree of privacy that these people have. Okay, so the idea is that, you know, along these two dimensions, when you're on different parts of these two continuums, uh, the personal really interpersonal relationships between the participants or the members of the group or the audiences are actually shaped differently because of these two dimensions. Okay, so in this case, we can understand WhatsApp group chats as spaces with small number of participants and very, very high level of privacy, which is actually quite important to them as we'll see later on. So uh, very quickly about uh, a little bit about the study is uh, done with three WhatsApp groups, uh, pop music fandom and uh, the object of fandom is not really important in this case um, because we are more concerned with what they do with WhatsApp. Uh, so, but just to give you guys a background, one is a Mandelpop fan group. One is, uh, you know, uh, fans of um, an American singer and one is a fan uh, of Singaporean singer. So you can see that they're quite mixed in terms of uh, gender and age, uh, but they all, <clears throat> all of them resided in Singapore. Okay, so uh, I'll just share with you uh, our, fi our findings, my findings, which actually falls into four themes. But uh, before that, uh, we, we can also find some parallels between how they communicate on WhatsApp and your, our own experiences with group chats, even though they're not fan based. So you can see very similar things that happen. Uh, you know, uh, socializing, there's a lot of intertwined and sim simultaneous conversation and all that. So I think um, many of us will find this kind of uh, experience very familiar with our group chats. Uh, maybe it's like a family chat or friend chat. So you can see a quote there. Uh, actually, the, the fans don't really think much about their communication on WhatsApp. But actually what they do, uh, even though it seems very everyday, it uh, does have a lot of meaning to them. So what I'm interested is in is actually how do these communication practices and what they do on this WhatsApp chat uh, shape uh, mobile intimacy and therefore shape you know their meanings in fandom okay so uh, like i said there are four themes the first themes uh i think it's pretty obvious is that it allows them to build personal relationships because of the idea that it's private you know it's exclusive so they can talk about anything they want uh, one very important point for them is also the idea that you know whatsapp is very everyday uh, one of the participants one of the interviewees said something like oh um you know it's, it's the app that I chat with my mom, you know, it's the app that I chat with my friend. I don't really think that much about it. So um, the fact that they, they, they talk to other, you know, so-called uh, close and intimate people on the app um, has that, brings that everyday associate, association with it. It's like something I use when I chat with some other people that I'm close with. And one other very important thing is also the fourth point where the, um, in real life, IRL is in real life, a re relationship actually exists before them joining the chat. So you can see the quote here. Um, this guy, he's actually like a super fan, like a very famous fan within the fan community. And he hosts the Facebook group, a Facebook group and a WhatsApp chat. And he says that, you know, it's actually pretty different. And I also noticed that a lot of uh, participants actually kind of compare uh, other social media with this chat. And they say that, oh, it's actually different because you know the people there and uh, you also know that they're real fans. So the idea that, you know, they can actually sieve out the people and uh, only communicate with people who they think are more authentic kind of fans. Okay, so uh, yeah, you can see that they, they, they kind of screen the people who have they met before and they think they're harmless and, and sincere fans. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I talked about the first point already. They they perceive the people there as more committed because they have they seen them in real life and they have kind of assessed them and they say like, okay, these people are real fans, therefore we invite them. Um, they also value the the fact that you know WhatsApp gives them opportunities for interaction. So the outcome of this is that they actually prioritize uh, the WhatsApp platform. So like if they have news. Uh, instead of posting it in a Facebook group, even though they're still part of the Facebook group, they would actually say, okay, no, I think I'll just put it in WhatsApp. Okay, or if they do post it at both places, they'll put it at WhatsApp first. 
So uh, there is a kind of prioritization there because of the perceived uh, intimacy and perceived uh, closeness with the people in the WhatsApp group. Okay, so uh, they also, you know, communicate very uh, intermittently throughout the day. And this is like an uh, idea of uh, ambient intimacy. And they do give people, other people in the chat, digital gifts. Because the groups are small, so the biggest group that I observe is like 45 people, and the smallest group was six people. So uh, they do know each other. So the idea that, um, you know, they, they, are, they want to give each other digital gifts, you know, like a happy birthday greeting or like some, uh, you know, emoji, uh, you know, throughout the day or even on special occasions kind of helps them uh, build the personal relationships and the emotional attachment. Okay, so uh, the, the last point I will actually uh, talk about later, but just a very briefly touch on this is that the idea of uh, exclusive, exclusive uh, fan group is very important because they feel that they're part of something important and therefore they are more important fan. So the second theme that uh, I found uh, is actually the idea that, you know, WhatsApp, groups actually help them manage the boundaries between fandom and their real other parts of their life. Uh, and, but at the same time, uh, they are a bit amb ambivalent about it. So the idea that, uh, you know, okay, I'm always uh, with my fan, common fan, uh, fellow fans, it allows me to, at any time when I, you know, I think of something, I can talk to them and, you know, we talk together all the time. So we have a common experience, even though it's a virtual experience. Um, but they do, they, they do also say that, you know, it's a very good thing that it's on a smartphone and not on some other platform that, you know, uh, is hard to use on a phone because a smartphone is very commonplace. They can participate anytime they want and it's very invisible. So you can see uh, the code at the bottom. So one of the um, interviewees said that, you know, they actually don't tell their colleagues that they are fan and they participate in, you know, all these concerts and stuff because they're afraid of judgment. So when they chat on WhatsApp, uh, even though they're participating in uh, fandom, they don't need to deal with like shaming and judgment from other people because people will just assume that, oh, you know, you're on a ch chat app, you're just texting. Okay, so uh, it allows them to, you know, uh, become invisible in that way and also build some boundaries. So uh, like I just said, you know, perpetual fan mode, but also allows them to manage uh, certain boundaries between fandom and other aspects of their life. So uh, despite this, uh, they also talk about how WhatsApp is like, okay, it's great, you know, I, they allow me to do all this stuff, but then it's also very intrusive because yes, I'm always on fan mode, but uh, when other people are on fan mode, it doesn't mean that I have the time, you know? So they talk about notifications and people talking when they're not free, okay? But at the same time, uh, they also don't want to leave the group chat, okay? Because they, are, uh, they want the information and they also want the status that comes with being in the chat. So you can uh, just look quickly look at the um, quotes below. So for example, the one on the right say something like, it's the chat is irritating, but she has FOMO, which is fear of missing out. So she put it on silent, but despite that she keeps looking at it. So actually she spends more time, you know, checking. So um, they, they, do they do like the chat, but there's a certain level of ambiguity and ambivalence um, with regards to it. And the third theme is about uh, building an archive. So uh, basically it's a kind of rook archive where uh, there's a lot of cultural production, cultural uh, artifacts and archiving, but um, the fans may not see it as that because for them it's just, oh, I share this in, in my excitement. But it does form a RUG archive uh, in which uh, it contains cultural material that's not affiliated with uh, traditional memory institutions such as museums and schools and so on. Okay, so, but they do differ from other kinds of fan archives like forums you know, or websites because of the inaccessibility of the group to other people. Uh, the platforms are very, you know, simple catalog cataloging capabilities. You can't hashtag the attachments and stuff like that that you could do on other platforms. And of course, the lack of organization because when they share stuff, a lot of it is like, you know, oh, I found this, let me put it there. Or like, okay, I'm very excited to see this, I put it there. Okay, so uh, it does differ from other kind of other kinds of fan archives, but uh, it's still very, very valuable to them because a lot of it is very exclusive. And like I mentioned earlier, because of the perceived closeness with the members, uh, they choose to sh share in the WhatsApp first or the WhatsApp only. Okay, so it does, uh, it does hold a lot of value to the, the material inside does hold a lot of value to the participants in the chats. Okay, so um, 
one of the things that uh, are also is also very important is that because there's no cataloging or very simple cataloging in WhatsApp, it relies a lot on on memory. You know, so for example, uh, if they if they think about oh, you know, or something happened when we went for a concert, uh, they they would search certain uh, terms or certain dates within the chat. So the longer you are in the chat, uh, basically the more the more sense the archives make to you. Okay, so uh. Again, it's also about exclusive, exclusiveness because if you are not in chat, it's just basically you know rubbish. It's like if you were to export the chat history, it doesn't really make sense to uh, outsiders. Okay, so and also very importantly, uh, a lot of the materials uh, confer legitimacy to the groups because there are people who, for example, work in the media, so they have insider info, or are uh, people who happen to. You know, uh, you know, take fan camps in concerts and so on. So these are the materials. A lot of it, not all, but a lot of it, are things that you cannot find in mainstream media. So it uh, is very valuable to the participants, and it gives the group, uh, you know, a legitimacy and you know, uh, authority. Okay. So lastly, in the fourth team, um, I think uh, we kind of uh, know by now that you know, being in the group also gives you some kind of um, um, status within uh, within the uh, entire fandom, especially if other people in the fandom know that this group exists and they are not inside. Okay, so uh, one uh, quite interesting uh, case I found was how uh, is the example below. You know how this guy he was actually a member of two groups, uh, and he he selectively transferred information from one to the other to build his reputation in the other group. Okay, so um, basically what I'm getting at here is that, you know, fans do make use of these group chats to help to build their um, reputation or build the authority within uh, the fan ecology, but uh, it's important to also know that it's within the part of the fandom that they can see because it's Im impossible to see the entire thing. Okay, so it's all, it's all about a perceived, uh, you know, uh, the, that, that person's perceived uh, influence. Uh, within uh, the part of uh, you know the fan fandom that he participates in. Okay, so yeah, so basically that's uh, very much it for uh, findings. So basically, um, in this chapter, the main idea is that you know uh, WhatsApp fan chat groups or other fan chat groups on the mobile media are actually very private mobile fan spaces, and uh, they are very rich and meaningful with social practices. Okay, and uh, on a larger scale, it, we do we do think about you know whether social media is actually building community. And when we talk about this kind of uh, groups, uh, it it is a possibility that you know people do look for um, you know close groups so that they can uh, engage in the kind of discussions and um, you know personal interpersonal relationships that were celebrated in the early kind of social media like you know news groups and so on. So uh, I guess. Uh, to close, uh, you know, what I presented here is like uh, twofold. We can talk about, you know, how uh, the nature of fan practices are actually evolving. So instead of being very public, some are choosing to actually go private because the public kind of fandom doesn't really serve them or doesn't satisfy them. And also uh, in a more broad uh, term, we can also talk about, you know, how, uh, you know, generally uh, whether you are in fandom or not you know how we experience you know this kind of closed social networks so that's about it thank you okay thanks hattie so that was dr hattie lu of the chinese university of hong kong now our next speaker uh, hattie can you please stop uh, screen sharing okay thank you our next speaker is ha huang of the Western Sydney University, Australia. So, ha. Oh, you're you're muted. Thanks, Fernando. Yeah, a minute, and I can share my presentation. Mm, sorry. Sorry, a second. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Ha Huang, and I'm from uh, Western Sydney University. 
And um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the editor of the editors of the book, uh, Jason and Cecilia, for the wonderful opportunity that I had to be uh, part of the uh, very fascinating and very timely volume. And I'm going to talk uh, briefly about some highlights of my chapter, chapter 12 in the book. Uh, K-pop male androgyny mediated intimacy and Vietnamese fandom. So a uh, Korean popular music or K-pop has become a global phenomenon in uh, recent years. And I'm sure many of you have heard about K-pop or even familiar with uh, some K-pop stars that are often referred to as K-pop idols. In Vietnam, where I come from, K-pop is uh, an important part of the, and the latest development of the Korean way. And it is arguable that uh, social media, particularly Facebook, plays a significant role in the rise of K-pop fan culture, and particularly in the intensification of the fandom in the country. More importantly, according to uh, We Are Social in Vietnam, 97% rate of adoption of mobile phones is over double the 43% of laptops and desktop computers. Also, the weekly visit to the social network via smartphones is over double that of computers, uh, 52% and 21% respectively. These figures suggest fans assess Facebook fan pages largely through mobile media devices. Furthermore, the, multifunctional, uh, the, the multifunctionality of mobile phones substantially helps fans to engage in fan communities actively. Um, smartphones in particular increasingly have cameras, a diverse range of applications and continually improved memory capacity. This multifunctionality makes it more seamless than ever for fans to participate in Facebook-based fan communities. From constant checking, taking them posting videos and live streaming on the spot of idols events to archiving fan-made products. The encounter between the portability of mobile phones and the sociality of social media engenders particular kinds of intimacy. So in my chapter, I argue that there is a certain heightening of intimate feelings fans experience when participating in Facebook fan pages via mobile phone. In particular, sorry, in particular, the chapter looks into the Facebook-based fan communities of K-pop star G-Dragon to examine fan receptions of his androgynous look. It attends to the specific way K-pop elements such as androgyny work with the digital fabrics uh, in affecting Vietnamese fans' emotional realms. Here, androgyny refers to the gender blurring aesthetic that K-pop male idols often adopt in terms of outfits, in terms of outfits, uh, facial expressions, uh, makeup and demeanors. I argue that enabled by mobile media and Facebook, the mediated androgynous look of G-Dragon is able to affect the intimate realms of fandom individually and collectively. The mediated Androgynous look gives rise to diverse, uh, diverse and sometimes ambivalent feelings and emotion in fan communities. That happens both online as presented by comments, uh, emoticons, photos, videos, memes, uh, and acts like posting, liking, and sharing, and offline as demonstrated in face-to-face uh, -face interviews. Intimate feelings are intensified when fans can now seamlessly participate in Facebook fan pages through mobile media like mobile phones. 
the more farms engage in farm communities by sharing and articulating idol related texts and by producing farm made media products through mobile phones, the more intimate these communities become. G Dragon's Vietnamese farm communities exemplify how significantly enabled by affordances of mobile media, social media like Facebook becomes deeply embedded in the aspects of everyday life. This embeddedness causes boundaries between the private, the private and the public to be increasingly blurred. Intimacy then becomes more and more social, wide sociality achieves some intimate dimensions. So again, here we can see in the light of mobile and social media, how instrumental the concept of intimacy can be in, especially in problematizing affective online based communities uh, like um, the case of a fan community of G Dragon uh, in Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you, Ha. Huh? So again, ladies and gentlemen, that was Ha Huang of the Western Sydney University, Australia. Now, may I request all our panelists to turn on their videos? We shall now proceed to the Q&A. And to our attendees, our guests, uh, again, you may use the Q&A box or the chat box to type in your questions. You may also raise your hand, okay, and we will accommodate you. So we, we have a few questions in the Q&A box. And the first one comes from Mr. The Theodore Pastor. It is uh, addressed to James. So you talk about offline and online, but outside of the app, social activities in a historical context, as in before the app's emergence. I wonder about the alternative engagement possibilities that exist today as at least one of your participants mentioned such engagements and how that might color the participant's opinion and even judgment of the app and its social scene. Great, excellent. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for, for the question. It's a really good, a really good and really interesting question. Um, I, I mean, I'll start off by saying, I think one of the differences uh, uh, well, I'll speak just of Hainan particularly, rather than China generally, but in Hainan where, where, where my research is conducted, the online and the offline on the kind of history of those two spaces isn't necessarily that offline spaces existed and then there were online spaces, they're much more intertwined and the ways, uh, I mean, well, first, there are other spaces than online spaces. In Hainan, there's two gay bars and at least two cruising areas where, where gay men meet uh, in physical space. Um, but both of those spaces actually came about after the emergence of the internet. So those spaces uh, came into existence sort of late 1990s. So at the same time that the internet was being popularized in China. Um, and, and people talked about the ways that those spaces were intertwined. So for example, one of the cruising areas that uh, developed in a particular space of a park because it was near to what was at the time the only internet cafe in uh, in Haiko, the capital city of Hainan province. So, so there's kind of this, yeah, from the very beginning, the, the physical and online spaces have been intertwined in particular ways. Um, but that uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't, uh, there isn't this kind of persistent perception that physical offline spaces are, some, are somehow more real or more tangible or more meaningful than uh, digital spaces. And I think that's possibly the, the, the quote that's in the chapter that, 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 uh, that Theodore is talking about, um, is that for some people they did perceive uh, meeting other men in gay bars and in cruising areas as more meaningful, as more deep, they kind of used ideas around deep intimacy um, than meeting in online contexts. Um, so, but I mean, and then again, but even, even that you, people come to those offline, those offline physical spaces via most of the time via digital channels. So a lot of the men had no idea that there were even gay bars in Hainan. 
until they searched online and looked and found that information. So all the time, the digital and the physical are kind of intertwined in these ways. Um, I think the, the one thing I will say about blued and some of the distinctions between, between blued and physical space uh, is this idea that because blued is a mobile technology, it, it means that this ideas around community and the possibility of engaging with other men in physical space isn't just limited to gay bars and cruising areas. What blued does is it opens up all physical space to the possibility of, of, of intimacy between gay men. Um, yeah, so, so the physical and the digital are always intertwined and, and even more so through blued. I, ho I hope that answers Theodore's question. Okay. Thank you. The next one comes from Theodore again, and this one, this one is addressed to Hattie. So you mentioned the cultural and technical understanding necessary to participate in fandom. Did you find this to be different in these private spaces, like a group chat where people have personal relationships? Or as you mentioned, by the time they reach the social status necessary uh, to be invited to such a group, they already possess that understanding. I'm quite curious if personal relationships can overrule the initial necessity of this understanding. Okay, so, um, so I happy. think you are right. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you? Okay. I, I think you're right about the cultural understanding aspect because, uh, like I mentioned and like you pointed out, um, they have to reach a certain social status and people have to think that they are like real fans or you know they are they are illegitimate you know before they get invited. So in terms of cultural understanding, yes, um, I do think that I uh, some of them do are not so proficient maybe in technology, but because they want the information, they would learn it. So they would learn it. Uh, they would learn how to, you know, uh, upload stuff and how to download them and so on. In terms of technical understanding, I'm not very sure because I have chosen a platform, which is WhatsApp, that is really, really popular in Singapore. So uh, according to 2016 uh, statistics, uh, WhatsApp has a 97 penetration rate in Singapore. So um, I'm not so sure about this aspect. Uh, so what I'm saying is that, you know, it's likely that before they even reach super fan status, they already know how to use this platform. Uh, the outcome may be different if I had done research on something else, maybe like Discord, you know, or some other platform. So, but maybe in the future. <laughs> so, but in terms of technical understanding, I'm not really sure, but you are right about the cultural understanding aspect. Yeah. But for you, can I just intervene and, because uh, I'm seeing a question here in the, the Zoom chat that I think connects to what Hattie mentioned, but also uh, is connected to Haas' uh, presentation. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. by, it's by uh, Miguel Lorenzo Garcia. So maybe Hattie and Ha can speak to this. Uh, the difference between offline and online spaces are quite problematic. How would this relate to the studies of uh, fan group intimacies? Um, the idea of offline and online, I think it's not so important anymore. So that's why we bring up the idea of mobile intimacy. It's like, uh, it's a kind of intimacy that is can shift, you know? Uh, yeah, you're a fan, but uh, it shifts that kind of, you know, the feeling of effect or, you know, the investment you make. It shifts from physical, uh, you know, between physical spaces, it also shifts between across time and, and uh, across, you know, across time, across geography, across psychology, you know, across a lot of things. So I think the idea of mobile, intimacy being mobile is very important. I mean, in, even without this theory, when we look at our own lives, you know, we don't separate, right? You know, for example, now, am I doing a presentation online or offline? You know, we don't think in such terms. So I think when we conceptualize uh, certain practices, perhaps it's more useful to uh, recognize that uh, this kind of mobility. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, Hal? <laughs> Just raising her hand. Yes, I, um, I would like to contribute a, a bit to um, the question about the difference between online and offline spaces and how this relates to the studies of fan group. I think it's a very important question. And I do agree with uh, Haiti um, in one hand that uh, um, so uh, it seems that the difference between online and offline is not that important because like, for example, you can see that the 
the the the fan intimacy like i mean in 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 the relationship between idol and fan it exists before uh digital media uh, uh appear right like long long time ago so it's 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 a good reference point but as um i uh, uh demonstrate one of the things i demonstrate in my chapter is that the social media and mobile uh, with the which is enabled by by uh, mobile media uh its uh, important role lies in its ability to intensify the fandom like for example uh with the facebook uh based uh, fan communities in vietnam when they uh see facebook fan pages as a new and very important platform for the articulation of fandom so they tend to organize less offline activities like face to face they they still have but less that's what i learned from 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 the participants and also when they stream in in the facebook facebook has some kind of like the algorithms and its functionality enables some kind of ability to intensify the fabric of the of the of the of the digital uh, community so yeah it's it's very fascinating to think about the that kind of ability the functionality of 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 the digital media any other so comments from bit, me i have a little bit of a follow up uh, with the discussion with her and i was curious as you talk about um these spaces one of the things that came to my mind was, I mean, the, the fascinating thing I think about the, fa the Facebook fandoms is you've got these intimate um, fans, right? It's a very intimate relationship. And yet there's an intimacy coupled with the publicity or the public face of the Facebook fan page that they negotiate this very intimate relationship with their fellow fans and with, with um, what's his name? Um, the, the 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 what's his name the guy that they have the the, the, the guy that they love the, the k-pop star that they love right there's a very there's a feeling of intimacy that the that the participants are having but in, at the same time it's coupled with this very public facebook page right so they're negotiating this these two feelings emo, uh, consistently at the same time part of the intimacy is the declaring their love for this star in public right so it's this weird like dynamic that i think i'm seeing um of this private intimate and public intimate right that is I, that is kind of like fascinating to me and at play here yeah that that's that's also the thing yeah, sorry <laughs> because i also use the the idea of the uh intimate public yeah uh i, I think it's very useful to unpack that kind of uh, online based uh, fan community intimate public it's public but still it's very intimate because when you sit in front of a computer and you stream in like a uh, live stream uh, facebook uh, fan activities so you in the room just by yourself right you alone so it's kind of intimate feeling but when you stream in and you see other people but not like face to face interaction you see them you see them via comments and emoticons like angry uh, hilarious laughing yeah so it's it's real it's still real, like it's mediated, but it's still very real. Yeah. Oh, speaking of your chapter, huh, there is a question for you. If it is androgyny that binds the fans of G-Dragon, what other aspects of K-pop might result in other kinds of intimate fandoms? Yeah, thanks. That's an interesting question, and I've been thinking about it. So, um, you know, K-pop has been really phenomenal um, for a while. And of course, yeah, besides the androgynous look up um, that the, the Korean men idols are often adopt in terms of uh, cosmetics and outfits and expression and demeanors, there are many other kinds of um, aspects of K-pop also very, like, attractive to fans around the world. Like for example, uh, there's a lot of studies on the hybridity of K-pop, uh, like for example, in terms of genres. So under the label of K-pop, they actually um, uh, employ a lot of uh, Western uh, elements, uh, music, uh, Western music elements. 
works uh, in terms of genres, in terms of the way they make um, create uh, music videos. And um, so when these kind of hybrid, um, hybridized cultural hybrids uh, disseminated around the world, they kind of create, generate different um, uh, resonance uh, in different uh, audiences around the world. Like for example, for the, for the Western fans, they of course have some kind of it's a bit different connections with k-pop uh compared to um like asian uh, or vietnamese fans uh, because it's k-pop but they can relate in terms of the western music elements in k-pop like k-pop um a, uh, using a, a lot of um, you know, Western composers uh, or producers, and they increasingly collaborate with uh, um, US, UK um, uh, producers and, and singers and groups in the production uh, process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the next question is for James again from Theodore Pastor. What did you observe to be, what did you observe about how the participants perceived community when it came to Blued? Blued. My assumption is that the app only allows private messaging. I don't know if that's correct. Did you see a difference between connecting as two members of the same community as you described in the case of the pre-app online scenes and connecting as two people for sex, romantic relationship, friendship? Okay, thank you. Um, again, really interesting question. Um, and, and yes, the, there is a difference. Uh, I mean, the ways that people discussed those kind of earlier, I mean, I say earlier, but the, the, there isn't this kind of complete shift from computer-based websites to just using Blued. I mean, those two things still happen at the same time, but they do definitely serve a different purpose. I mean, the ways that people talked about computer-based and uh, kind of more website or, or chat room kind of collective community spaces was more about in terms of accessing information, um, finding stories about the possibilities for living different kinds of lives outside of family and reproduction. Um, I, yeah, idea, it was more about ideas, information and collective, I guess, community in a way. But I mean, people didn't necessarily talk about community in, in that sense that they talked a lot more about accessing ideas, uh, stories and, and different information for understanding themselves and other people. Whereas with Blued, um, and because I guess the, the structure of the app and the way it's set up, it does orient you towards one-to-one, uh, -to person-to-person -person connections. Um, and then again, because of the structure of the app, and like I said, the, this kind of emphasis on the profile image as the primary face, that's one of the key different distinctions that people made between earlier technologies and Blued as well, is that you, you would go onto a website or a chat room, and then maybe it's like, 30, 40 people in there, you can't see their pictures, you don't know where they are, you don't know who they are. So, so you interact with them on that basis. Whereas on Blued, you kind of open it, you immediately know how far away that person is from you. And if they have an image of themselves, you know what they look like. So that's the answer, that's the that's what you're presented with as the kind of yeah, point of departure for the interaction and the intimacy that that, that develops afterwards. Um, so there was a perception that that blued, and then like I say, that's why there's those there's these debates around in what direction are gay cultures heading, and is are we heading towards a hyper a sense of hypersexualization because of blued? Um, I mean, I think it's more a lot more complex than that, but that tended to be the way that people would discuss uh, discuss blued. At the same time, though, the other thing I'll say is that given all of that, still that very act of opening blued. And being able to see, I mean, I mean, people would open Blued and be shocked and say, like, wow, there's like 30 gay guys within a kind of hundred meter radius of where I'm sitting right now. And 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 that does still contribute to those senses of community and belonging. Um, even if maybe not so explicitly, but that very act of being able to to yeah, to, to, to be aware that there are other gay men in the space that you're inhabiting. And people would then start to do things like looking at who, whose picture is on Blued and can I see them in this crowd of people around me? So there's, so there's, there's still that element of, of community there. Um, 
I don't know whether community is the right word, but there's that element of that sense of co-presence with other gay men in physical space that Blue enables. So yeah, yes and no, I think is the answer to that question. Yes, there's a sense that it does orient you more towards sex than friendship and uh, community and romantic relationships, but still it's very important in that sense of that, that gay men exist in physical space. Okay. Thanks, James. Now the next question is for Jason Leah from Jan Bernadas. Um, in what ways does global intimacy and mobile media extend or even challenge ongoing conversations about parasocial relationships in fandom? And he says, congratulations too. Uh, I, I, I want to address uh, uh, Bernd's question. I'm, I'm not necessarily an expert in uh, fandoms, <laughs> but um, I think, uh, so I want to speak more broadly about uh, local intimacies and how it's kind of, uh, it, how it sets up the kinds of uh, relationships that are allowed in, or that emerge in uh, these uh, particular spaces. Um, I think what's interesting with the kind of uh, you know with the kind of parasocial relationships that uh, we have it here in the East uh, Southeast Asian region, particularly, is that um, they're very much and and this is why uh, Leah and I talked about social intimacies. They're very much circumscribed by the broader social dynamics that are at play, and and particularly because uh, Asia has very diverse histories with. Uh, either uh, colonialism, post-colonialism, neo-colonialism. And uh, these impinge on the kinds of uh, mediated relationships that uh, we're able to have, I think. Um, and so that it, it, th there are particular inflections that, that come out. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak beyond um, uh, the, the, what, what I wrote about uh, in, in the book together with Dr. Christian Culiantes and connect it uh, with the current research that I'm doing because it's kind of related to what uh, 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 Bern was saying in the question and studying fans of K-dramas uh, in, in the Philippines uh, at, at the moment. And I'm particularly looking at how uh, they engage with uh, portrayals of romance uh, in, in, in these uh, uh, programs. And, and what I'm seeing here is that what, what uh, they, they bring to bear in terms of how they think of their uh, K-drama idols, for instance, and the kind of parasocial relationships that they create, is that uh, the way they look at it uh, is inevitably tied up with a kind of uh, distinct post-colonial history that we have, or uh, colonial history and post-colonial present that, that we have in the Philippines, that obviously uh, heavily influenced by uh, the Spanish who, who uh, colonized us for uh, close to 400 years and then the Americans for um, around 50 years uh, as well. And how that's kind of shaped the kind of imagination of, of intimacies that, that we have that is uh, really, you cannot really separate out the, the influence of these uh, colonial histories into how we see our intimacies today. And then when they try to relate with uh, intimacies in uh, K-dramas, they find that that one is a, more of a mix of uh, the Japanese colonialism that happened there together with uh, the modern engagement of, of Korea uh, with, with the US. So uh, in, in terms of trying to understand um, their relationship with their K-drama idols, uh, what happens is that there's always this negotiation between where they're coming from, from a Philippine uh, perspective and the kind of context there is, and then bringing that to bear when they uh, watch K-drama. So uh, clearly what, what I wanted to point out is that uh, the intimacies that you'll find are very uh, global in the sense that you really cannot really separate out this is global or Western and this is local and, and Asian. Everything is now uh, very much intermingled together. And I, I, I would really, uh, you know, go against any idea that you can separate them because they're, they're so intertwined with each other. And it's, I think what's distinct with our experiences are the unique inflections. Uh, uh, and, and maybe to end just to say that in the, in the Philippines, for instance, uh, what we have in terms of uh, the, the intimacies of the, the middle class uh, participants I have in my study is it's really a mix of 
the Catholic kind of like the Catholic Christianity uh, that we have is very conservative, but also trying to uh, negotiate that with with you know the American influence, which tends to be a bit more modern, and then that kind of uh, intertwines with with Korea that has this very confusion core, but uh, is kind of shaped by the forced modernity by Japan and then also by by you know its engagement with with the U.S. So yeah, these parasocial relationships that we see are are very much uh, local uh, intimacies. Leah. I'm not sure what I can add to that, except to say that I think when we, we also have to think about while we do position, um, we do, you know, we often think of the global between the global North, global South or West and East, right? Um, and I think we also have to think about global within our own region, right? And that the relationships or that the, the influences in these different intimacies, right? also happen within the region. Um, and that in itself is also part of the local intimacies that are happening. Like it's just, so it's not, so if we th think about the, the work of Hattie and Ha in, in, in uh, these seemingly local fandoms, but also with the connections to other parts of the region and you can't take away the, the connect, how it's linked to things that are happening in the larger globe, right? That it's not, that it's not, um, it's not separate from that, or it's not um, sheltered from that, right? Just because it's happening in Asia, right, or within Asia, right? So I think um, I think those those uh, we we can th we still see those influences even as we are in these very local spaces that we're living in, or that these fandoms, for example, or the or the or the folks that um, that James researched um, on in. Um, in, in Hainan, right? That even there are, they, even there, even in, even if they're in such a locality that they, you can't remove, um, you can't. It's impossible that there's no link to other spaces mm -hmm. outside of that locality. Okay. Uh, would anyone else like to comment? How, how quickly time flies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so unfortunately, well, this has been a fascinating discussion, but unfortunately, that's all that time permits. So on behalf of the uh, Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub and the Department of Communication, I'd like to thank our speakers, um, Cecilia S. Uitioko, Dr. Jason Cabanes, and Dr. I mean, Dr. Lee, of course, Dr. Jason Cabanes, Dr. James Cummings, Dr. Hattie Liu, and Ha Huang for joining us this afternoon. And we'd also like to thank our uh, guests who joined us through Zoom and Facebook. Thank you for your time. And we hope that you enjoyed this webinar. So um, thank you, bye. everyone. Thank bye. you, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs> thank you so much, Ha. <laughs>